Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 9 of MD6028. So we're in the portion of the module where we're talking about viruses and their ability to cause disease and a big part of understanding the bigger picture of this is understanding how scientists have developed therapeutic interventions that disrupt the ability of viruses to cause disease because when we're talking about therapeutics in the context of viral infection that's what we're talking about we're talking about interventions that disrupt the ability of viruses to cause disease within a host usually as you'll see this means disrupting the virus's ability to replicate so it means targeting the viral infection cycle and as we're going to see this is a big part of antiviral therapeutics and this is what we're going to start by discussing so we're going to start by discussing specifically antivirals and when we use the term antiviral, we mean a therapeutic intervention that is specifically targeting viral infection. And as we'll see, generally what these do is they disrupt the viral life cycle. So they disrupt the life cycle, the replication cycle that we've defined in previous lectures. This isn't universally true. It's not, it's not true that all antiviral agents will disrupt the viral life cycle directly. Some will um, be immunomodulators and things like that. They'll target the immune system. But as we're going to see, a huge portion of these antivirals specifically target the viral life cycle. OK, and what we have here is a reminder of what we're referring to when we talk about this viral replication cycle or this viral life cycle. Um, it's the process that the virus undergoes within the host and it's the process by which the virus makes copies of itself. So we can see it is split into distinct stages here and each of these stages must be successfully completed for the virus to produce copies of itself and therefore to establish infection within a host. The principle of many antivirals is that if we can disrupt this cycle, we can prevent the virus from establishing infection and then therefore we can treat disease because we're preventing the disease from occurring because as we know the disease is a consequence of infection the stages labeled here attachment entry genome replication genome expression assembly and release now we have talked through each of these stages in some detail previously so hopefully we understand what each of these stages represent attachment entry genome replication, genome expression, then assembly and release. Hopefully we understand that when all these stages occur correctly, new virus particles are released and these new virus particles can then infect additional cells or infect additional hosts. So strictly speaking, antivirals are drugs that target this viral replication cycle. However, we do include other therapeutic interventions under the banner of antivirals sometimes. So we've mentioned immune modulators. So these are therapeutic interventions that target the immune system. Again, not strictly speaking antivirals in the traditional sense, but we often lump them in together because ultimately they are treating viral infections. So the end point is really the same. Um, we can contrast these traditional antivirals, so the actual drugs that target the viral replication cycle with antibiotics because antibiotics target bacteria. So again, completely different group of drugs. And this is a fundamental concept that I'm sure we understand. But just to reiterate it, antibiotics are targeting bacterial infections. Antivirals are targeting viral infections. Um, and again, the way these antivirals work is they disrupt viral replication by targeting specifically this replication cycle. Um, it's really difficult to develop antivirals. So there's some really well-known challenges that are faced when trying to develop antivirals. Um, we have some of them listed on this slide. Um, some of them have been discussed in some detail on the module before. One of them is this idea of side effects. So when developing antivirals, we have to consider that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites that use host cell machinery to replicate. So there is always the issue that antivirals could potentially target 
the healthy host cells because they are targeting cellular processes that viruses are engaging in. So viruses are engaging in host cell processes. If we disrupt those processes, yes, we are potentially disrupting the viral life cycle, but we are also potentially disrupting the same normal process in uninfected cells, so in healthy cells. And obviously this is an issue because it means the drug is toxic, it means the drug has significant side effects, and that's something we really need to avoid. One kind of way around this, um, or way to mitigate this, is to target the portions of the viral life cycle that are unique to the virus. So we've discussed the idea that all viruses will have some enzymes that are their own. So even though they rely heavily upon host cell processes, they will bring in some of their own enzymes, at least one. So many antiviral drugs will target those viral enzymes rather than targeting the host cell enzymes, because again, this reduces toxicity. Um, if you want examples of this, we can think about the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So there's a whole wide range of reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and these target the reverse transcriptase enzyme that retroviruses use, because this enzyme is not found in healthy host cells. It's only found when it's carried into the cells by these retroviruses. So that's why it's an effective target. That's why we can develop these drugs with low um, toxicity and low side effects because there's no reverse transcriptase in healthy cells. Um, another example would be the protease inhibitors. So some viruses will also carry their own protease inhibitors and protease, no, sorry, some viruses will also carry their own protease, which is an enzyme that processes the viral proteins in assembly. And this is a viral enzyme again, so protease inhibitors, drugs that inhibit the function of protease, will only impact viral processes, they won't impact healthy cells. So again, we're seeing these strategies to develop antivirals that strictly and um, deliberately try to avoid this issue of toxicity, because ultimately, if an antiviral drug is toxic, so if it has side effects, then if the side effects are bad enough, then it's just not going to be approved as a therapeutic agent because, you know, it's essentially toxic. Even if they're not as serious as, so if they don't meet the threshold of seriousness to mean the drug can't be approved, so the drug is still approved as a treatment, if there are still side effects there, then it means people are less likely to take the drug. This is particularly true when we're thinking about chronic viral infections. So when we're thinking about long-term viral infections, it's very difficult to encourage individuals to take daily drugs. Um, if those drugs are associated with side effects, you're potentially looking at someone dealing with side effect of the drug constantly, potentially for the rest of their life, which is obviously a really difficult situation. And we understandably would associate that with a lowering in adherence. So individuals would just be less inclined to engage with the therapy. So many problems associated here. Um, there's other issues when trying to develop antivirals. So it's far more difficult to work with viruses in the lab than it is with um, many other kinds of microorganisms, particularly if we're thinking about dangerous viruses. We're talking about very specialist lab facilities. Um, these cost a huge amount of money and that money's got to come from somewhere. So it's one of the issues is just this straightforward fact that it is difficult to work with many viruses and the resources are just not there at a lot of research institutions. So overall, there's less groups working on anti antivirals when compared to um, those working on antibiotics. Okay, there's some other challenges as well. So the issues around animal models are really well documented. So many viral infections cannot be modeled effectively in animals. So there's no animal model, meaning there's no animal species that we can infect with a virus that is sufficiently similar to the disease that we see in humans and to the virus that infects humans. So there's no kind of model system that we can use in animals. So again, really difficult to test any drugs that we do develop and really difficult for us to get these necessary steps in before they are approved in humans, 
because generally speaking, these therapeutic interventions need to be tested in animals to check if there are toxic effects before they can be tested in humans. And if the animal models aren't there, then you kind of hit this brick wall where it's difficult to develop drug candidates any further. Um, it's difficult to think of any solution to this. Um, again, if the animal models aren't there, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not um, a therapeutic intervention can um, be taken further. Again, it's sometimes it's just a bit of a brick wall, which means it can be very difficult to move some of these drug candidates forward into clinical trials. Despite these challenges, we do have antivirals that are in use and have been approved, not as many as we would like or perhaps expect, considering the range and variety of viral infections that exist, but we have over 100 that are approved and can be used. Uh, most, well, about half of these are against HIV, um, and many overall are against these chronic viral infections. Um, so it, it, that partially reflects the seriousness of the HIV and the AIDS pandemic, but it also reflects the fact that it is easier to study um, antivirals targeting chronic infections in humans because you have this long disease period where you can test the drugs. It's a bit more difficult when we're talking about acute disease cases um, because there are obviously many acute infections that it's desirable to develop antivirals to, but there's some additional challenges there. Um, and these antivirals that we're talking about here, the antiviral drugs, they are again targeting the stages of the viral life cycle because the principle is if the stages of the life cycle are disrupted then the process can't be completed and the virus therefore can't establish infection and it can't produce um, copies of itself it can't produce these progeny that would then go and continue infection so you're essentially making infections stop at a particular point in this infectious cycle whether it's an attachment with attachment inhibitors whether it's a genome expression or genome replication with these the inhibitors of these process processes or it's an inhibitor of release at the end or it's a protease inhibitor that's targeting assembly the principle is the same these drugs are disrupting specific stages in the viral life cycle and in doing so they're disrupting the ability of the virus to infect okay as we've said a huge number of the antivirals that exist target hiv and we refer to these as antiretrovirals um, so antiretrovirals are just a subclass of antivirals because they are specifically targeting HIV, which, as we know, is a retrovirus. Um, it's worth noting as well that some of these antiretrovirals can and are you can be and are used against hepatitis B virus because, as you'll remember from our genome expression and replication lectures, hepatitis B virus engages in a form of reverse transcription so it carries reverse transcriptase the specific process surrounding reverse transcription is different to the retroviruses so different to hiv however it still involves a reverse transcriptase and therefore many antiretrovirals will also function against hepatitis b virus as well as hiv Okay, so what we want to do now is work through some of these groups of antivirals. And as we said, these antivirals are targeting specific stages of the life cycle. So it makes sense to work our way through the life cycle and look at the groups that are targeting these different stages. Um, this isn't going to be anywhere near comprehensive or exhaustive. There's, a, as I said, a large number of antivirals, but what we're trying to do is establish the principles. So understand the way the groups can be distinguished from each other and define these different groups so that when you're looking in the literature, um, you'll understand the context when you're reading about the specific antivirals. So firstly, we can think about the entry inhibitors because it kind of makes sense to put this group first, right? Because these are the initial stages of the viral replication cycle. So we have a lot of different antivirals, antiretrovirals that target these stages. And again, as we've talked about, the principle is if the virus can't attach and enter, then the viral replication cycle can't get underway and therefore the whole process is disrupted. So we have two examples here. We have Merivirock 
and we have enfervitide, two different drugs. Both of these are used against HIV, so they can be considered antiretrovirals. Now, Merivaroc competitively binds to a co-receptor used by the virus. So we've talked about how viruses attach to receptors on the surface of the cell, but there's also a process called co-receptor attachment. So the virus attaches to the primary receptor, and when it attaches to the primary receptor, then a secondary interaction occurs with a co-receptor. Now for HIV, that co-receptor is usually something called CCR5. Um, there's one called CXCR4 as well, which is also for HIV, so there's a bit of variation. But the principle is the initial attachment to the primary receptor occurs, then the secondary attachment occurs with the co-receptor. And again, what Merivaroc is doing is it is competitively binding to the co-receptor. So it is binding in the place of the virus. So the virus can bind to CD4, the primary receptor, but then it can't engage with the co-receptor. And therefore this attachment stage is disrupted. And fervitide, this binds to features on HIV responsible for attaching to CD4. So HIV has these surface glycoproteins that bind to the cellular receptor, which is again CD4, and fervitide will bind to these viral components that and therefore prevents binding to the cellular receptor. So again, it is disrupting the process of attachment and therefore it is preventing the life cycle from occurring. There are also fusion inhibitors, so viruses with envelopes fuse the envelope to the, to the cellular membrane, and this is something we've talked about before, so I'm not going to go over it again now, but we understand that process, and we've talked about fusion inhibitors, and said these drugs disrupt this process of fusion. Um, so again, we're not going to talk about that again, but it fits in here, doesn't it? Because we're talking about antivirals that disrupt a specific stage of the viral life cycle and therefore disrupt infection. Okay, the next stage of the viral life cycle are genome replication and genome expression. And we have antiviral drugs that specifically disrupt these processes. Um, we can't really tease these processes apart when we're talking about um, uh, inhibition and drug targeting. So usually an antiviral drug that targets genome replication or genome expression actually targets the both. Because as we've seen, the two processes are really interlinked and overlapping in viruses. So if you disrupt viral genome replication, you're probably disrupting a lot of viral genome expression as well and vice versa. So we're getting this targeting of um, uh, genomic processes, we say. So we can use genomic processes as a term to encompass both these um, processes. Again, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, a type of drug we've talked about previously. Um, these are drugs that specifically target reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme involved in retroviral genome expression and genome replication. If we think back to the expression and replication lecture for viruses, um, retroviruses specifically, you'll see how reverse transcription is a precursor process to genome expression and replication for these retroviruses. So if reverse transcription is disrupted by a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, then neither genome expression or genome replication can occur, and therefore viral replication has been successfully disrupted. We've split reverse transcriptase inhibitors into two groups here. You'll see these two groups being referred to very frequently in the literature. So we have the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So NRTI or NNRTI. So NRTIs, um, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these are analogues of nucleosides that are processed into analogues of nucleotides. And these nucleotides are included in the chain that is being created by reverse transcriptase. This is why they're analogues. And originally they're a nucleoside, 
but they're processed into a nucleotide. It's not a true nucleotide because it's an analog of nucleotide. So even though it's included in the chain, it is an analog, so it's not a new true nucleotide. And as a consequence of it not being a true nucleotide, the whole process of reverse transcription is stalled because reverse transcriptase isn't able to add any more nucleotides on because the drug is a nucleotide analog after it's been processed and therefore even though it can be added into the chain it is not sufficient to have additional nucleotides added on so it causes again chain termination it causes abortion of the whole process and then rtis these are the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors so these are drugs that target reverse transcriptase itself the enzyme without functioning as nucleoside um, analogs so they don't get added into the chain like the nrtis they just disrupt reverse transcriptase directly and here we have that process defined and summarized clearly um, so again it's a uniquely viral process that's what reverse transcription is and reverse transcriptase is a uniquely viral protein um, this process is never occurring in a normal healthy cell because again the enzyme does not exist and that's why these two classes of reverse transcriptase inhibitors the NNRTIs and the NRTIs are really effective antiretroviral drugs because they one they're good at disrupting this process and two this is a specific process that they disrupt so therefore we have low toxicity we have to consider in the case of many of these chronic infections that there's more to the story than just disrupting the viral life cycle um, so disrupting the viral life cycle can stop an active infection so it can stop the virus from replicating and producing new virions that can then go on and cause infections of additional cells in the host so that's how the virus is spreading however they can eliminate these retroviral genomic insertions which are in the host cell genome so again these antiretroviral drugs are inhibiting the viral life cycle which is really useful and can stop the spread of infection through the host so it can stop this active infection state however as we know hiv is a latent persistent infection in the sense that it integrates its genome into the host cell genome these drugs don't do anything to combat that once it's taken place so if the virus has already integrated its genome into the host cell genome disrupting the viral life cycle isn't really going to do anything because it's not going to excise the viral genome from the host cell genome on the contrary if we can treat someone before the integration has taken place so before infection has become established then we can actually prevent this integration from occurring and that's when we can prevent someone from actually um, acquiring the infection so actually becoming HIV positive because you're disrupting the infection before this integration occurs and of course this is what um, the pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis refers to so this is a type of intervention we've talked about before where you can treat someone pre the establishment of infection and um, whether it's pre-exposure to the virus or post-exposure to the virus it doesn't matter because it's taking place before the infection is established so pre-exposure to infection just means someone takes these antiretroviral drugs every day and then if they are exposed to hiv hiv can't replicate it can int introduce its genome into the host cell genome because these drugs are disrupting the cell cycle, so the life cycle of the virus, so it never occurs. If it's post-exposure, an individual takes these drugs after they've been exposed to HIV, but before HIV has had the opportunity to integrate its genome into the host cell genomes. So within 72 hours after an individual's been exposed to HIV is the window. Um, 12 hours is ideal. After that, there's, it's less likely that the effective that the treatment will be effective. And outside of that 72-hour window, it's not um, tried um, uh, uh, pre-exposure. No, no, sorry. Post-exposure prophylaxis is not used because at that point HIV will have already integrated its viral genome into the host cell genome. Um, 
This essentially means, therefore, that these drugs can't clear infection once they're established. As we know, they can control infection, so the drugs are stopping HIV from replicating, so they can stop someone from progressing from HIV to AIDS, um, but they can't actually clear the infection because they can't eliminate the viral genome copies from the host cell genomes. Another issue with these antiretrovirals is they can have this really fast um, resistance rate. So they can develop resistance really quickly. And this is something we've touched on before because we've explored the idea that viruses replicate much, much quicker than other forms of microorganism. And therefore, they can very rapidly develop resistance to these drugs. Um, one solution to this that has been really successful is the use of multiple drugs at the same time. So we refer to this as being a type of combination therapy. And in the specific treatment of HIV, we refer to it as highly active antiretroviral therapy. And we contrast it to the original antiretroviral therapy, which was a monotherapy. So we're talking about a combination therapy compared to a monotherapy. And again, it's just this idea that we've talked about where it is much more difficult for virus to develop resistance to multiple drugs compared to one drug. Because if you are treating with multiple drugs at the same time, the virus has to essentially acquire resistance to all three drugs at the same time to survive the host environment. And it's very, very difficult for any virus to do this. And indeed, highly active retroviral antiretroviral therapy is effective so this does work again even in these situations it doesn't actually clear the genomic copies from the host cell genome so the viral genome copies remain in the host cell genomes so this brings us on to the issue of what can we actually do about this um, hopefully it's clear why the traditional antiviral drugs, so antiretroviral drugs in this case for HIV, are not overly effective if used in a traditional sense because they're not clearing out the latent genome copies from the host cell genomes. However, there are certain interventions we are exploring as a research community to clear the viral copies from the host cell genome or to specifically target and kill cells that have the genome integrated. Because if we can't clear the viral genome from the host cell genome, what we can hopefully do is target and kill all cells that have the viral genome integrated into it. Because if we can clear all these latently infected cells, that's another way of clearing infection. Um, one strategy that's being explored is this idea that's referred to as shock and kill. So the idea is a type of drug called a latency reversing agent. This is not an antiretroviral drug. This is not an antiviral drug. This is a different type of drug. It's specifically a latency reversing agent and it is used to cause um, HIV integrated cells. So cells with the viral genome integrated into their genome to expose themselves. OK, so these cells are essentially forced to express the viral genome and these cells can then be hopefully easily targeted and killed. So it's a combination of latency reversing agent with therapies that will kill these cells. And that's why we refer to it as shock and kill because the cells are being shocked. They're being forced to express the viral genome if they have the viral genome within their genome and then they are being killed by other therapies used at the same time. Um, for, a long, for a long time, for a few years ago, um, this was really popular in the sense that everyone was talking about it in research and it was seen as the next massive step forward. Um, it's not necessarily um, looking as good as it was expected to look or it was hoped to look in some of the research that's been published. Um, so it's definitely not dead as an approach. It's definitely something that's still being explored. Um, but as of yet, there's some challenges to still figure out. Um, when I'm explaining it here and when we're reading up on it, we're often going to see these quite simplistic explanations, shock and kill, um, getting the virus to expose itself and then killing the infected cells. And these are accurate and it's a clear way to understand the process. However, obviously actually doing this and developing a way to actually fill these steps out in the lab 
and then getting this done in actual patients is really, really difficult. And there's a lot of challenges there, um, which is clear from the literature, as you can see. I've put some papers on the right here, and if you read these, you'll be able to see all the challenges that are um, faced by these researchers. OK, so we've covered the key concepts relating to antivirals there. Again, some of the concepts we've discussed a little bit before, but we've added some detail there and put some context in and also talked about some new things like LRAs. Um, so that should be really useful information. What we want to do now is talk about vaccination. So vaccination, very, very different to antivirals. So we're talking about a different approach. However, it is still a way that we can therapeutically intervene on viral infection. We're just therapeutically intervening prophylactically, right? Um, we're instilling resistance to a potential infection. Um, this is the principle of vaccination. We're making individuals immunized. We're making them immunologically incompatible with viral infection before they get exposed to the virus. Um, obviously there's a lot of complications here and there's a lot to discuss and that's what we're going to talk about now we're going to talk about some of the details of ways in which vaccination has been used to control viral infection we're going to talk about some of the challenges that have been faced okay um so first off we want to get this distinction of antivirals and vaccines completely clear um, we can use antivirals prophylactically, as we've said, so you can treat someone with antiviral drugs before they become exposed to a virus. However, there's issues around this. Um, straight away, we can think about an issue with pill adherence. So we know that there are some side effects with many antiviral drugs. And so asking someone to take antiretroviral drugs every day in case they become exposed to a particular virus um, there's issues around that. A lot of the time people won't want to do that. Even if they do decide they want to do it, they may forget to take pills. Um, there's something called pill fatigue, where the longer you take drugs every day for, um, the more likely it is you're going to end up missing days and things like that. Um, we also have to think about the ongoing cost of someone taking drugs every, every day. Um, so there's a lot of challenges there. And this is why prophylactically we lean towards vaccination because vaccination usually requires either just one shot or one shot with another shot and then maybe booster shots after that to instill resistance. Um, so it's preferable over prophylactic drugs. Um, obviously, prophylactic drugs are still sometimes used. Um, often this is when we don't have an effective vaccine or and when we can identify a specific group that is at high risk of a particular infectious disease. Um, if we can treat them prophylactically because they're at high risk, that's something that um, is often done. Um, and again, that's usually done when the vaccination isn't available because vaccination would be preferable. Um, similarly, if someone has already contracted an infectious disease, that's when we lean towards antiviral drugs because antiviral drugs are going to be treating the actual viral infection. It's too late at that point usually to, to um, intervene with vaccination because vaccination is prophylactic. It needs to be done before an individual is exposed. Um, there's a, some little exceptions. If we think about rabies virus, for example, we can vaccinate individuals post-exposure prophylactically um, for rabies virus. However, it's still prophylactic. So pro meaning before because it is before the virus has actually established itself in the host. So it's after exposure, but it's before the virus has actually established itself. And that's why if an individual um, has been exposed to rabies and they've experienced symptoms, then they have passed that window so they can't be post-exposure prophylactically vaccinated anymore. It won't work because um, the infection has already established and the vaccination needs to be before the infection has been established. OK, um, that being said, um, vaccinations aren't perfect. Despite these advantages over antivirals in the prophylactic use, they're not perfect. There's a lot of issues related to them. Um, one significant issue that's been an issue for a long, long time, you know, has a lot of focus now, um, but it's been an issue for hundreds of, well, a hundred years, 200, 
uh, over 100 years at least we'll say um you can kind of find these cartoons in um the v victorian era cartoons um saying that people shouldn't get vaccinated and vaccination will have these awful effects and what i'm hinting at here is this idea of uh, people having an anti-vaccination stance so people being disinclined from engaging with vaccination as an intervention and there's reasons that people feel um disinclined to get vaccinated some of these reasons are understandable um some of them are not really um valid or science-based we'd say um but we're going to explore them we're going to have a little think about them because it can be something that you can discuss in your essays because it comes into this wider context doesn't it at level six we're not just trying to understand whether interventions work so work technically so whether they are efficacious we want to think about if they're effective so if they work in the real world and part of effectiveness does really come down to this context because you can have a vaccination that, that is you know on paper effective and it should work it's efficacious and effective however when we consider the effectiveness in context let's say it's a vaccination no one wants to take then it's not actually doing any good um so these are things we want to talk about um a lot of students here We'll go on to be scientists some um, will go into science communication and this is really relevant to both those things and um, particularly when we're thinking about science communication okay if we think about the way antivirals and vaccines work as well we're thinking about two very different um kind of approaches so as we've said antivirals are specifically targeting the viral life cycle and this is what we have on the right of the slide here this text um, vaccines aren't doing that so again vaccines aren't actively targeting infection what they're doing is they're inducing a protective immune response so they're activating the immune system in such a way that an individual gains protection to a particular infectious agent so an individual is becoming immunized to this infectious agent as we can see on the left there's a lot to discuss here there's a lot of potential issues and real issues both with vaccination but also with drug use so really we're thinking about neither of these approaches being perfect but both of these approaches being very very useful in context and if um, conducted in an appropriate way and often that means with education so as with a lot of these interventions when individuals are resistant um, or they don't really um, they're not inclined to engage with them individuals can become more inclined if they're educated of the risks and they gain some understanding of the underlying science of what's being done and again this is an issue because not everyone is scientifically literate and we can't expect everyone to be scientifically literate and there is a way to communicate individual communicate scientific information to individuals who are not scientifically literate literate they're not able to read the scientific literature because they don't have the appropriate background there's a way to do this which is not patronizing and that is productive and understanding and you know kind of goal orientated towards this goal of increasing um, understanding in such a way that individuals feel more comfortable engaging with um, these kind of public health drives um, and again this is what a lot of science communication comes down to okay so we have some evaluative points on the left here these are the kinds of things you'll be thinking about if you're discussing these issues in an exam so there's low compliance with vaccination and also drug interventions at specific points um, so compliance is an issue in both of these worlds as we've said there's things like pill fatigue with drug usage um, however with vaccination there's more of a um, kind of ideological stance against vaccination but ultimately this both comes down to issues with compliance vaccination often only requires a single course so this is something we talked about how drug interventions are ongoing but vaccination is sometimes a single course then followed by boosters um, for antiviral drugs diagnosis is needed um, so when someone has become infected in, with an infectious disease you then need to diagnose to treat with um, antiviral drugs if we're using drugs 
prophylactically we really need to identify individuals who are at high risk because it just doesn't make sense to have masses of the population on daily antiviral drugs um, particularly when many of these viruses that do have the antivirals available typically we think about HIV and a few others here um, are spread by very specific transmission routes um, so we can actually find individuals who are at high risk and target those with the intervention. Um, if we think about vaccines, we can acknowledge the fact that vaccines don't always work. So if someone is immunodeficient, they can't be successfully vaccinated, um, particularly if the vaccine is um, an, an attenuated vaccine, so it's a weakened form of the pathogen. Often it's not appropriate, it's not safe to administer this vaccine to someone who is immunodeficient uh, because the pathogen is a live form of the pathogen but it's a weakened form so it doesn't cause disease in a healthy person but in an immunocompromised person it could be different. Um, there's also issues around this like we've said anti-vaccination so an ideological stance there's also socioeconomic and political issues and this ultimately comes down to who has access to these interventions so we can say everyone should become vaccinated but there's a lot of intricacy about how that is actually conducted um, and there's you know reams of information and papers on this um, if we even just think about the practical side of getting vaccinated um, if we're talking about individuals going to um, a health center to actually acquire the vaccine you know it's easier for some people to get time off from work than others it's easy for people to some people to pay for transport for, than others what about where we put the vaccination center where in the city where in the region what about people who are living in really really rural areas there's quite a bit of complications around here and you know it's it's, it's not necessarily something that means vaccination um, is a, it's, it's not a massive barrier to vaccination it's just considerations to be made with the way that vaccination is implemented and that's what a lot of these facts are they're just considerations to be made when we're evaluating antiviral drugs and vaccination so specifically with vaccinations we need to consider what a good vaccine is so as we've said a vaccine is something that stimulates a protective immune response so this is the first kind of um, factor of what an effective vaccine should be. It should induce a protective immune response against a particular infectious agent. And this response should be significant enough to counter any um, behavioral changes that we may observe as a consequence of vaccination. So if an individual becomes vaccinated to an infectious disease, they, and this is statistically, um, they will often assume they have a level of protection because it makes sense to assume that because that's why they're being vaccinated. Um, as a consequence of this, they may change their behaviour and their change in behaviour may make them more at risk of the particular infectious disease that they were vaccinated against. Okay, And if this change of behaviour increases their likelihood of contracting a particular infectious disease to such a degree that it overcomes the protective power of the vaccine, they can actually end up in a situation where they're more likely to catch the infectious disease than they were before they're vaccinated. Because even though the vaccine did offer them some immunological protection, their change in behaviour may be so severe, um, may increase their likelihood of encountering the infectious agent by such a degree that it ultimately counteracts um, the protective effect of the vaccine completely. So again, a consideration to be make when, made when we're thinking about vaccinations. Um, Ideally, vaccines should have a long-lasting protective immune response. So there's been a lot of discussion about how long the protective response from some of the COVID vaccines lasts. Um, and again, it's difficult to say until we can actually measure the decline of that response. Um, different vaccines will have different um, kind of lengths of memory of immunological memory associated with them. So they'll confer protection for a different period of time. Obviously, the longer that memory is conferred for, the better it is and the stronger the vaccine is considered. Uh, we also have to think about the practical side of vaccination. 
Um, and that means developing the vaccine and getting the vaccine to the people who need it. So how is the vaccine going to be made? Is it going to be cost effective? How is it going to be transported to individuals who need it? An issue with many vaccines, and this isn't the case with most drugs. Most drugs can be stored at room temperature, but many vaccines need to be stored at um, you know, either cold temperatures or potentially even freezing temperatures. Um, but for, for, for most existing vaccines, we're talking about cold temperatures. Um, and cold temperatures doesn't sound so bad because it sounds like you can just keep it in the fridge. And that is partially true. But a lot of rural um, areas, and if we're thinking globally now, not just in the UK, don't necessarily have access to those facilities. And so there's an issue called the cold chain. The cold chain means how a vaccine can be transported from the place where it's made to the individuals who need it whilst being kept cold so it's sufficient temperatures the whole time and this can actually present some real challenges so again it's a consideration to be made oh and of course a vaccine is non-pathogenic so it has to be a form of the microorganism or a portion of the microorganism that when administered is not going to cause significant disease in a human individual Usually when we're talking about vaccines, we're thinking about active vaccines. That's what we've been talking about so far, because active vaccines are vaccines that do induce this protective immune response in an individual. However, we can also consider passive vaccines. So passive vaccines, they're not really what we think of as vaccines, but what they do is they confer an immunological protective immunological response to a particular infectious agent in a slightly different way. And the best way we can think of it as being an antibody based intervention. So we can think about an individual acquiring antibodies to a particular infectious agent and in doing so, they're gaining immunological protection. And this happens naturally because you get maternal antibodies when you're a fetus um, and it also happens potentially artificially. So this is when you take um, products of an immune response in a healthy individual or an individual who's recovered from a particular infectious disease and you essentially inject them into an individual to give them um, a level of protection against the infectious agent. So it's, a, it's kind of under this banner of passive vaccination, but it's not traditionally what we think of as a vaccine intervention. So we've mentioned that vaccines can be attenuated vaccines. Um, and what this essentially means is the vaccine is a weakened form of the live pathogen. So the pathogen has been weakened experimentally in the lab. And this weakened form is used to induce a protective immune response in individuals. And again, it's weakened, so it's not capable of causing disease in a host. However, it is still capable of replicating and it is still capable of inducing a protective immune response. So you may have heard of the Sabin polio virus vaccine. So this is essentially a form of polio virus that has a, a mutation in the five prime non-coding region. And this mutation impairs its replication. So it's a weakened form of the normal polio virus vaccine. It still induces an immune response because it's still um, capable of replicating to, to a degree and it still has all the components of polio virus, but it is sufficiently weakened that it doesn't cause disease. If we think about herpes virus, um, there are point mutations that can inhibit a viral helicase um, and these essentially result in attenuated virus. And this is something that's been explored as a potential stepping stone towards a vaccine. Um, this is just a little bit of a sidetrack. Um, this is to do with killed vaccines. So it's a pathogen that has been inactivated, often in formalin. Then you can inject someone with the inactivated pathogen. It won't cause disease because it's inactivated, it's dead, but it can induce an immune response. It can um, therefore confer protection. Um, it's generally weaker protection than is seen for attenuated viruses because these inactivated pathogens are not capable of replicating at all. So they don't induce as strong as a protective, as strong of an protective immune response, but often they can still induce a response. So there are some effective killed vaccines. Um, I have a diagram um, on the right here. 
and it's demonstrating the effectiveness of the polio um, myelitis vaccine really um so it's a killed vaccine really effective vaccine however as you can see you know just the, the, this massive drop off in polio virus cases um that polio vaccine was apparently contributing to and it's also interesting to um, point out this because there's something called the cutter incident that we've mentioned and this is where this vaccine so this killed vaccine was in a single case cutter incident not adequately killed and it ended up with the vaccine in its infectious form so just the infectious pathogen being injected into a large number of individuals of individuals and there were a, a huge number of cases resulting from this which led to people dying including children so obviously just a complete disaster and an awful thing to happen um, and people some people will look at this and see it as proof that vaccination is dangerous um, I mean to me what it's proof of is that the process of producing vaccines is not um, infallible and that there needs to be massive effective checks on everything that's done um, it's not an inherent issue with vaccination um, it's an issue with the process in this case that's how I interpret that okay so we have DNA vaccines as well so the idea behind DNA vaccines is that if you can introduce DNA into an individual and this DNA encodes um, a viral protein or other um, yeah viral protein that um, will induce an immune response you're essentially creating viral proteins inside an individual and inducing immunity that way and again it's not the whole virus being introduced into a host it's just dna encoding specific proteins so there should be no um, risk of any pathogenesis there should be no risk of a live pathogen being injected um, with the attenuated vaccines there is sometimes the worry that the virus could acquire the ability to cause disease again very very unlikely um, and believed to be in many cases impossible for this to happen really because you have entire genes cut out of the virus um, often so in this case it's hard to imagine how it gene would make its way back into the virus but again this sidetracks that issue completely and as we all know in the context of covid there's rna vaccines now that operate under the same principle and this is what we're looking at here so the papers from last year um, discussing the use of this vaccine candidate at the time so at the time it was a vaccine candidate mrna1273 um, again the principle is that the rna is being introduced into an individual and it can then be um, turned into protein and the protein that is produced will induce an immune response and this immune response should be protective okay so there we have quite a bit of information on vaccination again hopefully really useful we want to contrast that to antivirals um, because you know that they're two very different interventions that are still being used to prevent or treat viral infections so it's really interesting to acknowledge the differences between the two particularly when we're thinking about evaluation it's not often a case of one or the other if an individual has an infectious disease that is viral and they can be treated with antivirals again that's a situation where they likely will be treated with antivirals um, but it's still useful to understand the differences between the two okay so what we want to talk about now is the existence of self-limiting infections so we've talked about the use of antivirals to treat active infections however we also want to consider the outcome if a viral infection cannot be treated so if we don't have a viral antiviral intervention or any other means of treating an infection what can we often expect the outcome to be um, as we know not all viral infections are fatal um, many viral infections are self-limiting in the sense that they will um, cause pathogenesis they will cause disease they will infect a host but there's kind of a natural end point of that and we can predict what the end point will hopefully be in a healthy individual um, and we can refer to these often as self-limiting infections and that's what we're going to discuss now so there's many of these self-limiting infections um, 
many of them we just don't have antiviral treatments for. Um, many of them are acute and short term, meaning if we, we, we did have antiviral treatments, it's actually difficult to use those appropriately because when someone is experiencing symptoms, so when the infection is symptomatic, they are reaching the end stage of infection anyway. So by the time someone knows they have a cold, usually they're in the symptomatic phase, right? And this symptomatic phase is, as we've talked about, a consequence of the immune response. And this immune response is usually going to naturally clear the infection. So they have reached a point where they're they are most symptomatic and their immune system is most active in clearing the infection. So at this point, um, it's quite late in the infection and usually there's only a couple of days of the infection left. Um, so even if we had antivirals, it's unlikely that they'd contribute significantly to the clearance of infection. Um, we don't have effective antivirals in that case anyway, so it doesn't matter, but it's definitely something to think about. Um, it's, it's, these factors are the kind of things we think about when we make the switch from um, intervening to clear infection, which is what antivirals are doing to try and stop replication and clear the infection. Um, we make a switch from this to thinking about symptomatic treatments. So what treatments can we actually use to make someone more comfortable and to alleviate symptoms? Um, again, curative treatments, not always possible because we don't always have the antivirals and there's some other reasons we just mentioned, but symptomatic treatments um, are often desirable in these cases and often what we're talking about are just, you know, decongestants. We're talking about paracetamol, we're talking about fairly basic medicine that is, again, treating the symptoms so it's designed to reduce the symptoms make someone more comfortable again these are different from the curative treatments that we're talking about with antivirals and it's just quite important we understand this distinction and particularly in the context of self-limiting infections okay so a few examples of the kinds of drugs i just mentioned here so we have decongestants and um, anti-inflammatories so we know um the inflammatory response is part of the immune um, activation to the presence of a microorganism and the inflammatory response plays a role in clearing infection but we also know that the inflammatory response can cause significant discomfort and can be associated with symptoms of infection so it's unsurprising that anti-inflammatories can be seen as a therapeutic intervention to target the symptoms of many um, infections, many of them mild and acute, but also quite serious infections can have um, inf an inflammatory component as well. Um, and this is when you can see anti-inflammatories used also. Um, antipyretics, painkillers, anticonvulsants, anti again, all treating the symptomatic consequences of infection. Um, I mean, there's this interesting argument about whether it's better to wait out these acute um, mild infections um, because these immune responses that often cause these symptoms are there for a reason. Again, the immune responses are active in clearing infection, but also they cause significant discomfort. So there's a balance there. OK, and that's all we really want to say about self-limiting infections, because you want to think about those um, treatments, the nasal decongestants, the antipyretics and painkillers and things like that in the context and understand they're not antiviral interventions. They're obviously not vaccines. Um, they're not antiviral in any sense, really, other than they are treating these general consequences of viral infection. And that's why in these cases we can see the same interventions being used for viral infections as bacterial infections. You, know, you use the same paracetamol, whether it's a bacterial infection or a viral infection, if someone is taking paracetamol for those infections, because the consequences of the infection in terms of the symptoms and the causes, the immune response, are significantly overlapping and in many respects the same. Many respects. So upstream there's differences so the specific immune receptors being activated are often different though not always but the downstream signaling converges 
and the inflammation is really very, very similar or identical. And therefore, this is why we see the symptomatic treatments are the same. Um, and again, we need to understand this. We need to understand that in these cases, it's symptomatic treatments, and that's why they're the same, rather than in antiviral and antibiotic treatments, which are curative, and these are therefore different because they're targeting the microorganisms and the replicative processes they engage in specifically. Okay, right. Okay, so now we want to think a bit more about context. So again, we've talked about a lot of technical information on how we can develop treatments to target viral infections and vaccines to prevent viral infections. And we've touched a little bit about the context and surrounding these interventions, but we need to do this a bit more. We need to be really aware of the fact that when we're developing these interventions and we're thinking about these interventions being used, um, none of these things are happening in a bubble. And there's a really significant amount of context that we need to consider and understand. OK, so socioeconomic factors, this is something we touched on really, really briefly earlier. Um, I'm going to put this slide in as the opportunity for us to think about it in a bit more detail. Um, there's no way we could explore this even close to fully in a lecture. But what I can do is direct you towards some considerations that can be made. Um, this idea of rural communities is something that crops up and up, up again and again. And it's really significant because a lot of the time when we're making suggestions, Suggestions for things that should be done, or we're evaluating individuals, in, sorry, interventions that did work or didn't work. We need to consider that when we're talking about even an, just a national problem. So in one country, we're often talking about very, very different environments. Individuals living in a really rural area are living in a very different environment with different resources to individuals living in an urban area. Um, if we can tie climate into this um, and we're talking about, um, say, hot countries, um, so tropical countries, um, th th then we have to think about the things like the cold chain as well. If you we have communities that don't have access to electricity, they don't have refrigeration, obviously there's direct implications of this. Um, access as well, just physically getting to real communities can be different and it can take time education ties to this as well so there's a paper that i've referenced on the right which outlines this issue um, of mosquito net fishing which i i might have mentioned to you before because it's a really really clear um uh it's a really really clear um example of how education can impact the implementation of uh different interventions And the issue relating to mosquito nets is this idea that uh, mosquito nets were used in um, sub-Saharan countries in Africa. Um, they were introduced into these countries and, as an opportunity to prevent mosquito bites. So this idea of bite avoidance to reduce the transmission of plasmodia and other species that can be transmitted via mosquitoes and that are causative of serious infectious diseases. But because many individuals in these communities did not have an education in science. They did not understand the link between mosquitoes and mosquito nets and infectious disease. They didn't understand that infectious agents can be transmitted by mosquitoes. They didn't at least understand the seriousness of this. Um, and therefore they were essentially using the mosquito nets as fishing nets um, because that was a more immediate concern to them. You know, obtaining food was a more uh, immediate concern on this vague idea of infectious disease that again they didn't necessarily um, understand um, so education is something that really matters and it's something that needs to be considered when implementing these interventions uh, cost as well so some regions some countries can be considered as resource poor compared to others so just because interventions exist um, doesn't mean that countries or regions have access to these interventions. And on the right here, we have another paper which is correlating um, educational attainment with um, uh, condom use. Um, and th the um, issue of economic state status is tied in as well. 
Um, so clearly these are multifactorial issues. Um, it's really difficult for research scientists to come up with solutions to these issues. Um, but what we can do in our research papers is to make suggestions that will hopefully be followed. Um, and as scientists, we can focus on science communication as well, which will hopefully bridge some of the education gap between individuals who have studied science and individuals who haven't studied science. Um, it's also the issue of culture. So if we're thinking about um, very different cultures to cultures in the UK, often there's beliefs that are inconsistent with the scientific principles that we base our decisions upon and that are empirically correct. Um, and we have to deal with this, um, you know, productively and we have to understand that we're dealing with different cultures and again, try and bridge that gap educationally. Um, really, really difficult really difficult and again you can see this in the literature how difficult it is um, to uh, kind of advocate for scientific um, scientific education in some communities where the culture is just completely different to western culture but again this is one of the um, barriers that is faced and that we want to be aware of and this paper um, continues to um, draw attention to some of the um, barriers and some of the conflicts that are at play here. And again, this is really complicated stuff. It's not anything we expect you to um, kind of make any definitive suggestions for solutions for. It's just something you need to be aware of and you need to explore some ideas around if possible. And th these issues definitely aren't confined to, um, you know, rural areas and they're not always tied to socioeconomics within a, within a country. Um, we can see some um, pretty alarming statements coming from um, individuals who are in charge of things, so in charge of quite important um, decisions within a country. So this is former President of South Africa. 